a lot of the speakers that I'm going to bring you over the next couple of days are people we've got to know because we've told stories about them. And in um, our March issue, we told a story about an extraordinary couple who wanted to chronicle what was actually happening in the Amazon rainforest in real time and to do it in a way that could wake up the world. And they wanted to use technology, sensors, specially constructed cameras. The man who's going to tell that story, please welcome Greg Asner. Thank you, David, and thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be the sacrificial earth scientist, I think, of the day. I, um, I am Greg Asner. I'm from the Carnegie Institution for Science. We're based in Washington, DC. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the technology that David alluded to, which has allowed us to, for the, fir for the first time, to really explore remote places like the Amazon Basin. I'm also going to take a, a big risk and present this as a video where I pause the video at different times so I can explain what you're seeing without being overly scientific as I go along in the story. The, the work that we're doing comes from a sense that it, the scale of our challenge in managing the Earth and in understanding the Earth and in understanding our home planet is getting more and more difficult. That challenge is actually something that isn't getting easier over time, primarily because of our growing impact on the planet and the, the rate at which that impact is occurring. The, the expression of that, I think, is in something like this, a state-of-the-art NASA satellite image of the Earth. First of all, where are the people? You see the browns of the deserts and the greens of the rainforests and other types of vegetation, and you see the whites of the ice sheets. But what can you do with this to understand the planet? What can you do with it to manage it? Where is the scale uh, of the human enterprise in this process? Well, this image from Globia tells me much more about the human impact. It's not derived from those traditional NASA-type satellites. There are the night lights. This is, that shows uh, in the center the Indian subcontinent. You see Asia to the east, and you see Europe to the west. But really, it's a, to me, it's more impactful to see the interconnectivity through the internet. But if you go to a place that seems to be a frontier, you get these juxtaposition type stories coming from a region like the Amazon Basin. One is this same image of the internet connectivity and the night lights shows a huge green black hole, or a green hole in this case, that seems to be a wilderness that's uh, just impenetrable or that humans couldn't possibly have a major impact on. However, you read story after story uh, of deforestation and loss and the boom of the uh, Latin American economies, which drives this engine of, of forced loss over time. You read that, yet you can hardly see it. And that challenged us to develop new ways to take a totally new way of thinking to bring the, not just the uh, challenges and the, the problems of what's going on in places like the Amazon to you, but also to allow us to explore the really remaining special places within the Amazon basin and within other regions of the Earth. A lot of our exploration, for me personally, on a personal note, uh, it seems cliche to be following around James Cook, but I, I really do find him to be one of the great inspirations because he was an explorer who was a scientist, or a scientific mind, a navigator. Neil Armstrong, uh, of course, the same. And even today, with the, the work of James Cameron, has been inspirational for us in trying to develop technologies that I'm going to show you now that allow us to bring a completely new perspective to you. However, again, we're challenged by the problem that we're no longer exploring a planet that you know, is devoid of people or is devoid of change. We're exploring a planet and an Amazon basin, in our case, where this, the system is changing right before our eyes in, in at least subunits of the Amazon basin. And this graphic 
to me, really expresses the challenge of the kind of work that we are trying to do, the kind of uh, imaging and, and bringing this information to the public that, that we're attempting to, uh, to find our, our way through. On the far left, you have what I referred to as the exploration phase, where natural systems may be vast and un. Uh, known to contemporary science and to society, that propels us to try to, to develop our, sci our, our instrumentation, our sensors to do that. On the other hand, on the right side of the graph, which is the universal trend in these types of environments, is a kind of a, a changing of the system from totally natural to highly complex in terms of the human footprint, where protected areas and urban areas and vast agricultural regions are developed. And really, the natural systems become the minority uh, geographic player in the, in the process. So for us, our imaging systems, our science needs to be able to address those challenges as well. And we call that applied science. So this talk is really about seeing beyond the green. I love being put in the, the, uh, the session about uh, rethink what you see. Perfect for us. We feel that. Uh, Understanding what's really going on in these systems is challenging because the satellite, uh, the satellite technology doesn't allow it, yet walking around in these systems, they're, they're too vast and too complex and changing too quickly. So how do we do it? How, I'm going to give you a bit of a tour of the technology, build you up a few slides of, uh, of, of what's behind what we do. It starts with thinking about light. We use light in some very novel ways to image and to assess what's going on. You all think of light, and you can go beyond the green by mixing blue and creating cyan and so forth. We think of light in terms of splitting it, such as with this prism. We think of white light coming in, such as from the sun, reflecting off uh, an ecosystem or an, uh, a building or anything of, your, of interest to you, and then splitting that light into the rainbow for some sort of analysis or interpretation. This is my most scientific graph, it, it was very challenging for scientists not to show a lot of science. Uh, I, I love this. This is, seems to be an unsigned uh, piece of work that I found on the internet some years ago, and I, I teach with this at times. What it shows is that there's a, there's a rainbow of light that is uh, not apparent to you. Uh, we, we see in the visual range shown in the red to blue, and that range tends to be extremely small compared to what's available out there from cosmic rays on the far right to uh, radio waves on the left. And you can find where you want to be in this, uh, in this uh, electromagnetic spectrum if you'd like. I like being in the shouting car dealership commercials uh, associated with radio waves. We utilize that, uh, tech, that spectrum in really unique ways. You have a camera that images in three colors. We have built cameras that image in hundreds of colors, and not just the colors that we see visually, but also these other regions of the spectrum that are invisible to our eyes. One of the uh, uh, in, uh, technologies is called imaging spectroscopy. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying in a camera that can measure very quickly uh, the complete spectrum for every pixel in your image. And those spectra on the far right side are just cartoons of different types of materials and how their spectral properties can be different. And what's amazing about that is that those spectral properties are determined by the vibration, rotation, bending, and stretching of the atoms in the material that you are pointing the camera at. And from that, we're able to deduce and understand, believe it or not, the chemical composition of whatever we're pointing the camera at. That's going to be key in a few minutes. The second and final technology I'll, I'll mention is called light detection and ranging. It's the use of lasers. Whereas the first technology used reflected sunlight and analyzed it spectrally for the chemical information, we also use lasers and we fire those lasers, lasers as you will see, out of the bottom of the plane. And those lasers help us to image the system in 3D. What's unique about how we do it is we do it at extremely high resolution and extremely rapid pulse rates of up to 400,000 laser shots per second as we're flying over, for example, a forest canopy shown here. Those laser beams penetrate the canopy, and that red uh, signal on the left side of the bottom graphic uh, shows the, the vertical structure of an actual tree canopy. 
derived from just one of those laser shots. We've developed what's called the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. It's a system that uh, includes people, sensors, aircraft, and a, a lot of hard work. Here's the, a, a drawing, or I should say a photograph of the, um, of the instrumentation, just to give you some sense that this stuff is real and not avatar. Uh, one, we have an imaging spectrometer. Two, we have the laser system. And three, we have another imaging spectrometer that allows us to look in utter detail spatially. This is all on board a unique aircraft that we've uh, been working with that has a global range. And the, the system is, of course, sensors, but I emphasize that it's also computing technology, people technology, navigation, and finding our way about very remote places. And of course, having a cockpit is a useful thing nowadays for most of us who are flying an aircraft. The, uh, the process and the project includes a lot of support. We have engineers. We have scientists and technicians. And we have people who inspire us to actually push ourselves and, and, to, uh, and to really try to bring these uh, 3D landscapes to you. The bottom right is Jim Cameron, who's a spiritual supporter of me, and the late Andy White, who uh, was one of the great explorers who lost his life earlier this year uh, in a helicopter accident. I want to show you what we get. These are some static views from the system. This is not a photograph taken from a tower or taken from a hot air balloon. This is a 3D image taken from our system uh, where you see uh, in natural color a forested type landscape with a town and, a, and it happens to be a runway. And yet that's just the beginning. We also have uh, the system can see through the vegetation and actually measure how much carbon or biomass there is. The high biomass is in red and the low is in blue. Uh, we also have uh, this, the ability to see the chemical composition of the, of the landscape. In this case, we can actually convert that information to how fast things are growing. The more pink or red uh, parts of the landscape are those that are sucking up carbon dioxide faster than the, than the darker red portions of the landscape. Because we can fly high and image in extreme detail, we can then enter into the data and see it in a sectional view. We can walk around in it. We can analyze it as scientists, or we can inspire children uh, using the same images. This is a, a very high-resolution 3D image along the Brazil-Peru border, an area totally unknown to science. And it looks like a photograph, practically. It is, everything is in its proper place. And uh, it is chemically detailed as well, where in this case, the trees that are blue are deciduous, and the trees that are bright pink have a fresh flush of leaves and are really taking up lots of carbon dioxide. Whereas you see the world this way, the way we see it is much different. It's this way, a system of highly evolved organisms that are all different. This is basically a map of species. This is almost unknown to science, and you, you are among the first people to see this. This is a remote uh, forest in, also along the Brazil border. And now what I want to do is take you on uh, a bit of a tour. I have about seven minutes to talk about what are some of the applications of what we've done with the technology. That's the technology. Uh, where have we gone with it? And I want to start by actually not going to the rainforest. I want to go to South Africa and tell you a bit of a story just to get you warmed up with a simpler case, uh, but a, a complex problem. And, and the problem really comes from the fact that most of the world is being dissected into protected areas, as shown, in such as, as shown here in these blue uh, regions within southern Africa. And there's one uh, that you'll see. It's right here, if you can see the cursor, called Kruger National Park. It's an area of about 2 million hectares. That's roughly the size of Israel. And it has the, all of the prototypical challenges of protected areas in Africa, where all of the game, all of the animals have been brought into these systems to, to protect them. And the problem with that is that you end up having spikes in populations of these animals that traditionally, or I should say evolutionarily, have had long ranging, uh, long home ranges. Elephant are, of course, the most charismatic species in this case. And as a naturalist, I find going and seeing the elephant as an amazing experience, no matter how many times I do it. But the problem is, is that these parks, in this example, have so many elephants, they doubled in the last 15 years. And so there's that awful 
unsavory uh, problem of having to do culling. You think you have problems with culling here with the badgers. Imagine it doing it with uh, you know, a 10-ton uh, organism. And yet, it's done because when you have too, high of, too large of a population of elephants, you end up uh, having the elephants actually become a problem where they're taking apart the habitat. There are just too many of them. The problem with that is that many other charismatic species require the same habitat, from, a, from giraffe to leopards to uh, baboons and birds of prey. So there's a, a serious application to the kind of imaging that we're doing. Here's the problem is that it's hard to see where the elephants have the big impact and where they don't. This first video is the simplest, and it shows a, tr a fence line where the uh, National Park Service put up a fence and said, okay, we're going to see what the impact of the, of the elephants are. And so we're going to fly over that with our 3D imaging system, and it's just immediately obvious, simple to see, easy to calibrate your mind, that we're crossing from an area that has too many elephant to this area that has no elephant. Very simple result. What ends up being the case is that it, there are many more subtleties. It depends on the uh, precipitation, the climate regime. It depends on many things. And so what the technology is doing for the National Park Service in South Africa is helping them make more tactical decisions that can help them avoid culling, such as putting up fences in the more uh, areas that are, that are uh, more sensitive to this elephant population problem. I'm going to take us now to my, really my home turf, which is in the western Amazon basin. And one of the great things about what we do is we see, thing, see things and we see places that I, I, I venture to say nobody here has seen. I want to take you uh, first to some of the, the, the examples that are very applied, that, uh, that are big problems in the region, and then I'll take us to the exploration side. One of those is gold mining, and with the uh, decline of the economy and the rapid increase in gold prices, something like $1,600 an ounce now. There's been a boom in gold mining, all of it illegal in the Western Amazon. The Andes over geologic time have brought gold down into the lowlands and deposited it in a thin blanket across the bottom of the forest in the soil itself. And these places are places that, the, for example, the Ministry of Environment of Peru, the UN, they would like to know where the gold mines are and what are their real impact. It's very hard to get in there because it's extremely dangerous. It is remote in the sense of actually getting any kind of real data or any kind of real understanding. So we were brought in and we flew these places. And this first video here shows not only the, the footprint of one of the largest mines, and this scar is about four kilometers wide and about 30 kilometers long, but the, the vegetation that's shown around it is healthy if it's bright green and it's degraded if it's yellow. And so we're able to get a very tactical, very 3D understanding of exactly what's going on in a place that's nearly impossible to measure, very dangerous to enter, and just a mess altogether. Not only that, but within the mine, the spectrometer technology that sees the chemistry allows us to map the pollutants, such as mercury and sediments that are just laid inside these mines now in the surface uh, waters. I'll also add that many of the mines are clandestine. They're impossible to find if you're cruising down a river like I did here. So instead, we use the 3D technology to cross rivers. And this is an example of, on the left, the vegetation in 3D colored in their chemical concentrations and chemical health. And then on the right, because we're imaging with these lasers in 3D, we're able to remove the vegetation digitally. It's like a digital deforestation. And actually zoom in on the ground layer and find these mines. And that's all of these small uh, po pockmarks in the, in, the, in the forest here. M none of that had been mapped or, um, or brought to, um, to the attention of the authorities until we had been, uh, been able to bring it. The, another example is palm oil. It's a, it's a major, major uh, 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 force of deforestation in the Amazon now. Most people know it from Indonesia. But it's coming into the Amazon. And the left side shows an Amazon forest where red is high biomass, cathedral forests. And the right is what you get after you replace it with the palm oil plantation. It's not all doom and gloom. And what propels me more than anything is the sense of exploration and going to completely new places that you and I can't get to on the ground. 
Uh, our aircraft has extremely long range, so we're able to go uh, deep into the borderlands of places like Colombia, Peru, Ecuador. This example shows uh, an exploration of the northwestern Amazon and what we were able to find. Uh, this is an area that was controlled by the FARC, and as the Colombian government has done a great job of getting the rebels out of there, these areas are now kind of open to scientific discovery. This is an area that just looks simply green in Google Earth, but in, in fact, when we look at it in 3D, we see ex extraordinary variation uh, among the different types of forests that are out there, where in this case, in this part of the image, Red is high biomass, kind of the larger tree canopy, and yellow is this, the naturally shorter tree canopy. But really the thing we're after is shown here, which is a sense that the system is not green. It is a kaleidoscope of highly evolved species that have all different types of functions and forms. And that's, this is not painted or, or, uh, or a graphic of some sort. These are actual data from our system that shows you the fabric, the actual construction of the Amazon basin is just highly diverse. And here's a, a view right at the top of the tree canopy that I think is the first time I've shown as well in public. I have about uh, one more minute or, or, or so, and I want to uh, get, end with one last little story, which is even in the face of these land uses and these challenges, and in, with the prospect and the promise of being able to go out and explore places, we've been also hit by some interesting phenomena, weather phenomena and climate changes in the region, just like we're noticing around the planet. This is a map of, uh, of the big 2010 drought. You may have heard that part of the Amazon main stem of the river actually dried up in 2010. The red is areas, are areas where there was extreme drought. And we flew from this area where there's no drought into this pocket of red, very remote, and uh, made a discovery that just a, a few weeks ago, and what you're seeing here is we're gonna fly into the drought area, and as we get into the drought area, we're gonna go from a tree canopy that's intact, that's um, functioning the way as biologists we think it will, it, uh, on average, functions, to an area that is riddled with millions and millions of leafless and dead trees shown with the, with the pink color. This was the first time uh, I had seen this, and what's amazing is that this drought has caused extreme stress in the scientific community. The NASA and other satellites don't know if the drought made the, the Amazon get drier or wetter. Was it sunnier and the, 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 the trees did better, or was it so droughty that they did more poorly? And these are the very first scientific evidence that this region suffered. And to finish up, I'll say that we're, we're Working in three different areas now, we're, 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 one is we're trying to explore whole new areas of the Amazon, other parts of the world. Two, we're, we know that our technologies are really pathfinder technologies, and what we're interested in is pushing them up to the spaceborne level. What I showed you is not possible from any kind of satellite today, both civilian and military. And also, we think that the world of un unmanned vehicles is, it, it holds a lot of opportunity for bringing these technologies to a much more uh, wider audience. And finally, I want to say that a lot of our work is focused with bringing this knowledge, just the, the sense of these systems, to decision makers. And we've been pretty successful with that. On the left is the president of Colombia. On the right is the current minister of environment of Peru. And what you see, they're actually looking out looking at the systems on board, and they're experiencing their force for the first time in the way that we can do that. That's very rewarding, and I think it's promising for the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate the invitation.